We live in a fantasy world now. Reality has been destroyed. This is the time that you really need to pay attention. The probabilities are overwhelmingly on gold's side. That is the best environment to see gold increase its value. Welcome to Palisades Gold Radio. I'm your host, Tom Bodrovix. Joining me today is Matthew Pippenberg, partner of Matterhorn Asset Management and also the author of Gold Matters and Rig to Fail. Matt, thanks for joining me today. Always good to talk with you, Tom. Always Absolutely. Good. And, you know, it's every every time we talk, you know, we were just kind of discussing this before the call that it seems like we always have to talk about the same things. And it's just mm-hmm. seems like it's just getting incrementally worse and worse here. And, you know, going through a couple of your recent articles, I think you highlight that extremely well, talking about the U.S. really being in denial about recession. So let's maybe start by talking about what metrics are really showing us that the U S and, you know, really the world is in that state. Mm -hmm. No, it's, it's astounding really. And again, I always caveat, you know, you're a gold bull, so you're going to be bearish on everything. And that's part of talking your book. And I understand that, but whether if I were trading, you know, risk assets or arbitraging currencies, I'd still be pretty darn bearish on the fundamental macros and the recessionary indicators at the, at the, at the most obvious level in terms of a recession. I mean, you've got some basic empirical indicators that are pretty much ignored, but neon flashing signs. And that's things like the yield curve. I mean, you still get less yield on the 30 year than you do on the, t- on the two year. Uh, you've got the conference board of leading indicators, which dipped before below its recessionary indicators last December, almost a year ago. So we were, I think, technically in a recession just on that very important uh, conference board of leading indicators. Um, you've got a, a 3.31 or 3.3 percent dip in the M2 money supply or decline in the M2 money supply. That may seem nothing given the huge expansion of the money supply, but the slope and scope of that slip, the timing of it, is pretty negative and dark in terms of recession. You've got the Fitch downgrade of the U.S. Treasury this year. There's so many empirical indicators that I think this conversation about recession really, I think, is kind of kind of silly. But I think even more alarming, and again, not trying to be bearish, but just looking at the Main Street indicators, the mm-hmm. things that I don't know how, I mean, the greatest lies in the, in the mainstream media are always lies of omission. It's the same thing at the Fed or with the politicians, what they're not talking about. <laughs> but yet, are right in front of us all the time. They'll literally tell you the, the the earth is flat or the sky is green and the grass is blue. And you okay, if they say it enough, you believe it. But it's like I look at Main Street, you've got, you know, again, layoffs at major companies, many companies on the SP, the, the headline ones are like Spotify and Microsoft and Goldman and those. You've got over 450 bankruptcies now, year to date, which is twice um twice of last year's rate. And uh I think um you know the greatest kind of pace of bankruptcies that we have we've seen since 2010. The, the t- ten of those bankruptcies have liabilities over a billion. The top twenty of those have, um, I think, over 200,000 employees aggregate laid off. So I mean, these things are, are matter matter on Main Street. You've got credit card delinquencies and car loan repos at 2008 levels. So Main Street's clearly hurting between. Bankruptcies, when companies go bankrupt, the employees have problems, right? When there are layoffs, the employees have problems. When credit card debt is 20% and car loans are, it, you know, users' interest rates that were kind of subprime car loans, those are disappearing because repo men are picking them up. I call it also the Oliver Anthony indicator, this, this musician down in Farmville, Virginia, a, a town I know very well, actually. Um, and uh, it was kind of this anthem for the for the middle class, which is being completely eclipsed and uh, beaten down by non-reported inflation and rising rates and higher credit card bills. And, and he sings in his song, my dollar ain't worth X and, and tax to no end. It, there's a reason he has over 100 million hits in a few months. That that song, uh, he's not, again, a, a macro economist or a hedge fund manager or a gold executive. He's just a common sense human being. Mm-hmm. So between the the yield curve and the conference board of leading indicators and Oliver Anthony layoffs and bankruptcies um, and Fitch downgrades. I, I don't even know why we're debating uh, whether we're in a recession or soft landing or hard landing for, for thousands, millions of people. It's an extremely hard landing. Mm-hmm. And we still get this very specious you know, data on unemployment at 3.7% from Bureau of Labor Statistics. Again, we could spend time on just how comical and fictional that is, but like the CPI scale, the unemployment Indicator, which by the way will be a lagging indicator, but it, it's 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 never right, but it's always right because it's the official 
you know, number. And I, I always joke, like with inflation, unemployment's like Claude Juncker at the uh, European Commission. When the when the when the data is bad, we just lie. So all these data dependent points are not really data dependent; they're data manipulative. And again, people might say that's a conspiracy theory or just bullish. Or, I mean, bearish to be bearish or kind of a negative feedback loop. But I don't know how you can argue with these empirical realities between bankruptcies, layoffs, um, the the civilian labor forces stop looking for jobs. It's not even looked at by the Bureau of Statistics. And and then, you know, the Oliver Anthony indicator, et cetera, and these credit card delinquencies. Main Street's hurting. It's not just Wall Street. And, and you don't measure an economy by the SMP, uh, which is just rising and waiting for a, an eventual pivot to, you know, more liquidity or rate cuts. There's this carrot always pulling at the SMP to keep them in. And then it's an SMP, which is really being led by seven companies that have 30% of the market cap. And an SMP that's looking at 720 billion in, in debt rollovers in 2024, another 1.2 trillion in 2025. When those debt rollovers of those SMP corporations that are drowning in debt have to reprice their debt at a higher rate, you'll probably see pain. Right now, I think, you know, um, people are just picking up pennies, dimes, and maybe quarters in front of a steamroller. I, I, there's ways you could argue there's a melt up coming. You know, we still haven't beat the December 21, 2021 highs, even though we're talking like the stock market's immortal. So, yeah, I think the short answer is I don't think we're in a soft landing. I think we're in a hard landing. And technically, I think we're already in a recession. It just doesn't feel that way when you look at the S&P or the NASDAQ 100, whenever the, the, the rates market or the bond market tries to price in a rate cut or a pivot to QE, which nobody can time. I actually thought after this, uh, the, the uh, regional bank crisis earlier this year that there wouldn't be any more rate hikes, that there'd be an immediate rate cut. And I was dead wrong. I underestimated Powell's ability to postpone the obvious. And I've stopped trying to, the mugs game of predicting that. I'm very of the strong conviction that the pivot to more incredible liquidity, inflationary liquidity is inevitable. I've just given up trying to time it. Um, many people think it's coming in 2024. It's very, very possible. I just don't know. But uh, yeah, I think Main Street and even Wall Street indicators are already there to evidence a hard landing and a recessionary backdrop. I think if you talk to the man on the street who isn't playing polo in you know St. Moritz or Palm Beach, um, they tell you, like Oliver Anthony, things aren't so good. Mm -hmm. So yeah, I think most of our listeners and your listeners know that. Matt, could it be argued that we're actually in a depression rather than you know just looking at this this smaller kind of chunk in time that's called a recession? Yeah, it's interesting. There was a uh I looked at this like two or three years ago, actually, just right around COVID, uh, during the COVID crash, even before the COVID crash, when the S&P tanked just before unlimited QE. I think Wheaton Metals um, did a graph, and they were just like, what is the definition of a depression? What is a depression? Uh, they came up with this interesting chart um, on the, per, the, the, the rate of GDP per capita. And basically, it's GDP growth per capita. And technically, if you look at recessions in the past, including the Great Dep Depressions in the past in the 19th century, including the Great you know, Depression of the 1920s and 30s, uh, technically, if you look at GDP growth per capita, we've actually been in a depression, in a depression-level economy for over 15 years. Mm -hmm. Now, again, it depends on who you ask how that feels like a depression. You don't see bread lines like you did in those black and white pictures out in front of Philly or New York, but you have... The invisible bread lines um, through welfare receipts, checks, things that Oliver Anthony was actually singing about, a kind of a welfare economy. And you also have, again, an SMP that's up over 600% since the great financial crisis, but really only benefiting the top 10%. So if you ask people who are wealthy enough to enjoy this bubble and who have the lifestyle to question macroeconomics and think about these things, they'd say we're not in a depression. When you talk to people in Richmond, Virginia, or Farmville, Virginia, or Flint, Michigan, or Ohio, and parts of other parts of the world that aren't on the two left co left and right coasts and aren't in Wall Street or aren't in a, an industry that's supported by easy money, they'd say they're pretty depressed. <laughs> and and so I think it's not sensational to 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 ask that question and to answer it quantifiably and then commonsensically that for many people it feels like a depression. Mm -hmm. And so. Uh, someone was joking at, the, at both ends of the curve. You've got the extreme rich who don't really care what happens because they have so much money, an unbelievable amount of money, that even the worst market crashes would just hurt, but it wouldn't sting because there's so much money. The other extreme, you have such, such poverty 
that it's just a welfare state and their life just kind of stays flat. It's that it's that dwindling middle class that gets up every morning, commutes to work to pay a mortgage, a car payment, a tuition bill, groceries, where the BLS tells you everything's the same price or only 3.2% higher, and they know it's not. Those are the people, which are the backbone of every society in Europe, Canada, America, South Africa, Australia, New Zealand. Those are the people that are the heroes of our country that are getting just beaten down right now. And I think for many of them, uh, they already know the answer to that question. Mm-hmm. Do you think it could be argued, though, that, you know, in a way we're reaching the end of, let's say, a, a technological limit or an, the end of an energetic system, let's say. And mm-hmm. we, as we reach that limit before another breakthrough is made, that that growth kind of tends to start to stagnate. Yeah, I mean, there was a great French author named Saint Exupéry who wrote this book called *The Little Prince*, which most of us have probably heard of in some form or another. It's a pretty famous bestseller. I think it was only behind the Bible. It was written during World War II. He's a French guy. There's an airport named after him in uh, in, in Lyon, and uh, ironically, he was a fighter pilot during World War II. And a good friend of his lives in my little village. He passed away a few years ago. He was a, just an extraordinary man. But Sonic Zupri was writing about technology in the 1940s, <laughs> and he made this comment that you know we can produce thousands of pianos a day. We can't produce a worthy pianist, you know, a player. Mm-hmm. And he was kind of foreseeing what happens when technological or manufacturing evolution outpaces human intelligence, human wisdom, human maturity. We're seeing that now with obviously when you get Larry Summers and Altman on the board of a company, that's a dangerous sign for AI. Even Elon Musk is worried about AI and how far you can take it. I think we we have so much faith in technology and making people obsolete, whether that's at a checkout stand at a grocery store or at an ATM replacing bankers at a regional bank. This faith that technology will save us is ignoring that our intelligence as human beings, our wisdom, our tolerance, our economic savvy, our other qualities are being eclipsed by this faith in technology as if that's everything. When sadly, in a lot of ways, technology mishandled, misused, whether it's central bank digital currency or artificial intelligence, there could be a day five years from now where someone could replace you and me and AI, we could have an artificial conversation. I find that very dystopian. You can create an artificial spouse. I don't want to make love to a toaster dressed in a woman. In other words, there's a limit to how important AI or technology can take us. I think we're losing faith in our souls. We're losing faith in our own education, our own curiosity, our own desire to learn and do things. I don't want to learn five languages with a chip implanted in my head. I want to learn five languages by going to those countries, getting to know the cultures. So these are pretty obvious things to me. And to your point, I don't think technology is going to solve the problems financially, socially, and politically that are had, had hitting the world right now. They're certainly not going to f- solve America's debt crisis or global debt crisis. They're not going to solve a currency crisis that, com- that comes concomitant with a, with a debt crisis. They're not going to solve the social unrest of wealth inequality at record levels since the French Revolution or Weimar Germany or fascist Spain and Italy. When you start breaking down and governments become more centralized, more controlling in the name of national security or your best interests, those are never good signs. Mm -hmm. And uh, so I think we should be very skeptical when the experts tell us that technology is going to save us or create a new tailwind for the world when that tailwind is not big enough to solve the problems that are already existential right now, existential threats. Like, Talking about debt may sound academic. It may sound boring. The same numbers, 120% debt to GDP, 8% deficit to GDP, a negative 65% net invest, international investment position at the US. Um, all these things may sound boring or $34 trillion in public debt, $333 trillion in global debt. These are grotesque abstractions. And they may sound academic, but they have a direct impact on your politics, your society, your bottom line. And so technology is not going to save us for those problems. And politicians are just going to lie around them and lie past them and promise things that they can never deliver to get reelected. And so, uh, yeah, I think we have real, real common sense, neon flashing, obvious existential threats right now that technology is not enough to get us excited about, regardless of whatever your views on cryptos too, all that. There are advances, but there are dangers. And even crypto is a fantastic technology, but look what Sam Bankman-Fried or CZ, 
did to crypto. In other words, it's not the fault of crypto that someone's embezzling eight billion in commingled assets at F, at F, you know, it's at FTX, or it's not the fault of a crypto holder that CZ didn't adhere to anti-money laundering or KYC, KYC reg registration requirements and got a $4.3 billion fine from the Department of Justice. That's a human problem, not a technology problem. Technology was in their hands. They abused it. It's not the fault of a crypto buyer or a crypto believer, but it's the human beings that run those systems that create the chaos. It's the same thing with you know, the three branches of government in the United States. You walk through Washington, D.C., you see the Department of Treasury, you see the Federal Reserve, which isn't even a part of the government, but you see all these beautiful buildings. The ideas behind the founding fathers' notion of democracy, the ideas behind these buildings are fantastic. The people inside those buildings, different story, very dangerous. And so uh, I think we have a huge, going back to Sanang Supri, we've got the ability in technology. We have a disability in our human capital, our human wisdom, whether that's political or financial or even social with these extreme woke policies. It's, it's, it's insanity. Again, you don't have to be left or right. You know, we call it duck a duck when things are going crazy. You know, when we're even debating whether a man can dress up as a woman or put breasts on and jump in a swimming pool with a bunch of other women and, and break records, that shouldn't even be a debate to me. Again, that may that may spark my political color, but that shouldn't be left or right. That should just be common sense. I think most of us know that. So, yeah, uh, unfortunately, I, I don't think the technology tailwind is going to solve all the existential problems we have right now. Well, Matt, to your point, as you're really explaining this to me, it's kind of brings to mind this you know, almost a vision of stretching this technological elastic until it snaps. You know, it's not necessarily, as you said, the technology that was the problem, but it was the implementation of, let's say, fractional reserve banking and, <laughs> sure. and piling on more and more and more debt that yeah. ends up in this situation where we're overstretched and then boom, that band breaks and then we have to kind of restart in a way. Yeah. Yeah. What do you see as, you know, in a way, the end game? Is this the end game for these fiat currencies that have existed for the last, let's say, between 100 to 200 years here? Well, there's a lot of ways to answer it. It's, a, it's a certainly a, a relevant question for everyone right now. What's the value of my dollar, Canadian, Australian, American? What's the purchasing power of it? What's the value of my peso? In Argentina, they're going to try and link it to the dollar now. What's the value of my, you know, kroner or my Swiss franc? These are these things actually matter. You know, there's the famous quote by Voltaire that all paper money eventually reverts to its intrinsic value, which is zero. That's an extreme thing to believe when you can still go to a grocery store with a hundred dollar bill and buy something. So there's still value to your fiat money, but history shows without exception that governments, whether they're democracies, whether they're empires, whether they're fascist regimes, whether they're run by kings or queens, all governments going from ancient Rome to 1990s uh, Yugoslavia to today in the US and the European Union, all debt strap broke countries inevitably debase their currency to inflate their way out of debt. And at the same time that they do that, they also um, get more and more centralized. And that 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 raises the you know the extreme control from the political left, whether that's Bolsheviks or to the political right, whether that's fascists in, in, in Germany, Spain, or Italy in the 30s, or whether that's the current pseudo democracy we have in the European Union or in the US right now, where we've weaponized our currency, we've weaponized our Department of Justice, we've weaponized all our agencies to, in the name of public good to have more and more control. It's no coincidence that all these things are happening at the same time that our country's going broke and our currency is destroyed. Trusted. We have a declining U.S. Treasury in terms of its actual love as an unwanted asset from a from a basically bankrupt issuer. So that's why there are since 2014 net sellers rather than net buyers of U.S. Treasuries, you know, overseas and central banks, especially in the East, and why central banks again this year are about to buy more than a thousand tons of gold. They're not buying treasuries. This isn't a gold bug argument. It's just an empirical reality. There's a distrust of paper money in general, but the US dollar in particular, and that's scary because that's the world reserve currency. And this is stuff that Brent Johnson and I take debate on and issues on. We both have longer term, similar views on many things. Um, the US dollar is as a metaphor for all currencies. But when you talk about the US dollar, it's important because it is the world reserve currency. So if the US dollar is in trouble, that's a problem for everyone. We, we agree on that. And, and Brent Johnson's very brilliant milkshake theory is fascinating because he's arguing, look, 
despite all the warts and problems with the US dollar and its abuse by the central banks like the Fed, obviously, and the manipulation of it since we got off the gold standard in 1971, having promised to be gold backed in 1944, despite all those sins and political mechanizations, what other currency would you rather have? That's the same thing that Javier Mele is asking himself in Argentina. What, what else are you going to do? You got to pick the best horse in the glue factory. And in Brent, his milkshake theory has a brilliant thesis too, that look, between euro dollar demand and offshore use of dollars and loans off, outside of the US, between the derivative markets, between the petrodollar, this great big straw, this great sucking sound always creates, it sucks up those dollars. So you can print trillions and still see the DXY get 25% stronger since you know QE really started. I think that's a very logical and valid point. I think what Brent and I disagree on, I'm not saying I'm right, what I disagree on with Brent in terms of the dollar, because this is a relevant question, is that great straw or that great sucking sound or that I think better image is a sponge to soak up all those printed or mouse click dollars isn't immortal. And de-dollarization and the BRICS rise is changing that. That's one simple thing. Also, just because the dollar's risen despite QE relatively in the DXY doesn't mean the DXY goes to 150 because the inherent purchasing power of the dollar has gone down consistently. So you're just measuring the best fatally ill patient in the ICU. We're all in a race to the bottom. I don't think the DXY to Brent's projection will get to 140 or 150 for a number of reasons. I think the other thing that Brent and I would disagree on though is even if there was this great big straw sucking on US dollars, creating demand and keeping the dollar forever immortal, I think what I disagree on is that same straw or sponge isn't picking up US treasuries. No one wants our unloved Uncle Sam IOUs. It's an empirical fact. They're dumping them. They're not buying them. And the fact that if, if no one's buying or straw sucking, milkshaking sucking those US treasuries, that means the Fed will have to pay for them themselves because they're not going to let their bond market fail. They won't. There's way too many reasons that's not going to happen. They're not going to default. They're not going to let it fail at auction. So the central banks will have to print more money to buy those bonds and print more money to pay their incredibly high interest rates thanks to Powell's higher for longer policy. And like Luke Roman and like the St. Louis Fed in June of this year, that's what I call a dilemma of fiscal dominance, where the more we try to fight inflation, the more it costs to pay for our own IOUs, the more we create inflation. So we're in a debt spiral. We're screwed. We're, we're, we're trapped, in my opinion. So I think there may be this great straw sucking on the US dollars. There's a lot of reasons that's not going to keep the dollar at DXY at 130 or 140. Um, and also, there's not a big straw sucking on US treasuries. So you can't have it both ways. You either save the bonds or you save the, the treasuries or excuse me, you save the dollar. Throughout history, without exception, every government has always sacrificed its currency to keep its quote unquote system. However dyslexic, failed and corrupt that system is, pick a country, pick a time in the calendar, it's always the same. Um, it always kills the currency. So my view on the dollar, because it is related to debt, is, is very, very bearish. And even if the dollar gets relatively stronger on the DXY, you're still measuring a sick patient against another sick patient. It has no purchasing power. Uh, and again, there are just so many examples throughout history. You look at, again, at France, the 1780s, 1790s, that was once the greatest power in Europe. They had a king. They had beautiful Versailles. They had beautiful Paris. They had armies all over. And yet they got into a debt problem. They tried to solve that debt through literally QE1, QE2, QE3, QE4. Granted, it, French assignant at the time wasn't the world reserve currency, but it's a simple metaphor. This is what happens. You buy the euphoria. You go for the easy money. You buy some good times. It leads to a debt crisis. It leads to a currency crisis. And then who comes in? The guillotine and then Napoleon. That's an extreme example, but that's a metaphor for you kill your currency with fake money. You create social unrest. You create an avenue for opportunists like Napoleon to come in and save the day, but that means at the expense of your civil liberties and your rights and your freedoms, which don't have a monetary value, but they should have a human value. You can't measure that with a Bitcoin or even a bar of gold. And so that's going back to our original point. One of the fears that Brent Johnson and I absolutely share, however this plays out, is we're seeing more and more centralized control. And I was at a dinner in Zurich with some, you know, with, with Ronnie Sterfula and uh, Grant Williams and uh, myself and others, we were uh, Kai Hoffman. We were we just happened to be there at the same time. We were all going around the table. Just what are our concerns? It's interesting. We all have different views, a little bit. Ultimately, very similar views on gold and debt and the debt vicious cycle that we're in. But 
what's our fear and what's these symptoms is more centralized control from our governments, whether that be in Europe or the US or Canada or New Zealand. Uh, we're seeing it everywhere. These, these things are open and obvious. And so, uh, and there's a lot of reasons also why I think the US can't afford to have too strong a dollar because of its trade deficit, it needs a weaker dollar. Um, there are other things. It, if, 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 if the dollar gets too, st- too strong because yields are too high, that kills stocks eventually. And then if stocks get killed, that kills tax receipts. Tax receipts make it harder for Uncle Sam. That means he has to print more money, and that's inflationary, and that becomes dangerous. Um, they're going to need more synthetic liquidity, liquidity or printed money or mouse click money in some form um, because there won't uh, be spending cuts. Uh, they're going to need that to pay interest expense, which is over a trillion dollars just on our IOUs a year. That's higher than our military budget. They're not going to cut entitlements. They're not going to cut military spending at a meaningful level. So that money has to come from somewhere. It's not coming from foreign central banks. It will come from some form of synthetic, which means fake liquidity. We haven't had a a pure pivot to QE because we've been doing backdoor QE. Um, We did it through the TBTF program to bail out the too big to fail banks, not the regional banks. We guaranteed their 10, 30-year bonds at par. We didn't guarantee that to people on Main Street, but we created an immense amount of liquidity for the too big to fail banks. That's basically fraud. That's insider trading, in my opinion. That's an insider bailout. It just went unnoticed. Um, We also, just this this month in November, the last month, everyone said, look, the yields are coming down on the 10-year. There must be so much demand for U.S. Treasuries now. It's a safe haven. That's quantifiably not true. What you just saw in November wasn't investors running to the safety of that beautiful 10-year U.S. Treasury from Uncle Sam. What you saw was the Department Department of Treasury doing backdoor QE by emptying the TGA account, the Treasury General account, about $150 billion, which the which the TBAC or the Treasury Board Advisory Committee said they wouldn't do. They also issued a ton of more debt through the short end of the curve, at the two-year level, the, you know, the short end of the yield curve. So they're just creating more backdoor liquidity and, ca- and calling that a, a bond resurgence as yields get compressed. It's totally artificial. Again, not a conspiracy theory, not something your average guy in the street needs to know. But what I'm saying is this bond market isn't a safe haven bond market. And people that think there's value in those traditional safe havens. It's an inflated asset. It's a sick asset. It's on a respirator. It's paid for either by mouse click money or TGA manipulations or more debt issuance uh, at the short end of the yield curve. But, you know, even the con- uh, con- Congressional Budget Office, you know, we're at 34 trillion right now in U.S. debt, public debt. That's just government debt. They're in the next 10 years thinking about another 20 trillion in IOUs. That's assuming no recession. Again, boring numbers, bond market stuff but incredibly important because all it really boils down to is we have way too much debt and not nearly enough income. And the only way to fill that gap, in addition to fake debased dollars, is more political controls, more excuses, more lies, more blaming, more finger pointing, and more disunity in an identity politic ravaged world, especially in the US. You can't agree on anything in the US without being canceled or labeled extreme left or extreme right or crazy. Uh, But Take all that political, social politics, wokeism, whatever, out of the equation. And what you really have throughout history is a situation where you have way too much debt and no income. You're broke. You're bankrupt. And our 10-year treasury trades like an emerging market bond, not a developed economy bond. We're just extending and pretending until something breaks. And when it breaks and they do go to super QE, as Luke Roman would call it, don't blame that on COVID, a war in the Middle East. I always joke, maybe Martians someday. That's the new story. Uh, uh, but all of those problems are man-made problems. They're made by our central bankers and our politicians who want to get reelected by making promises they can't deliver on and pushing that to the next generation to pay for. That's neither left nor right. That's empirically the case. So all these things, debt, bond markets, currencies, politics are totally intertwined. And politicians who know nothing about basic math or basic economics, they just know how to give stump speeches. Guys like Gavin Newsom running in the DNC for the U.S., trying to sneak in behind Biden before 2024, we think, literally ran a bankrupt state like California. Bankrupt state. 700,000 people left that state. He defunded the police. He was a total hypocrite during COVID. Locked down the population. Well, he went to the French bakery to go to dinner. Um, He now has 65, 68 billion in in less budget because tax receipts are so weak in California because all the money left. So this guy is a governor of a failed state and he has a nice haircut. So they think he should maybe possibly be the next hope for the democratic party. Again, 
I could be a Democrat. They can give me better than Biden or Newsom. Please find me something better. Just like 70%, you've you got to come with something better than Trump on the Republican side. Again, you can take any side of this. It's amazing the mediocrity we have to choose from right now. But again, all these things are tied together. The least valuable part of this equation are going to your wisdom question or your technology question. The biggest weakness we have right now are weak human beings, weak politicians, weak central bankers who won't be transparent about the fact, honey, we're broke. Sell the car. Austerity is necessary. We've wasted too much money on programs. Ironically, what you're seeing in Argentina is someone trying to say that, literally take a chainsaw to wasted spending, who's trying to be transparent about, we're broke, we're broke, our system isn't working. Now, he's popular right now. We'll see how well he can do with that. I'm just saying it's always a human, all-too-human problem, and it's always a debt problem solved by more human, all-too-human opportunists who come in at the expense of what the, the real population needs, which is better... Uh, better honesty, better transparency in our policies. Well, and to your point, I think it's interesting just from an incentive perspective to try and figure out why we don't have, you know, a better, smarter class of people that we have to choose from to quote unquote, run the country. Mm -hmm. It Mm -hmm. just seems that the rewarding part of being a very smart, savvy business person isn't rewarded in a government area rather by the private sector. Well, it's it's certainly easier to say the right things to avoid controversy. It's certainly easier to show no profiles and courage by just cowing to the party line or the socially acceptable line to not speak authentically, whether that's on social issues or financial issues or political. That keeps you job. You know, if you work in a Citibank or Goldman Sachs, you get vaccinated or not, you're fired. That's not really a choice. That's coercion. But it's better just to say, I'm I'm all, that's just an example. There are many examples where it's just easier to toe the line. If you work for CNBC, it's easier to toe the line. Even Tucker Carlson couldn't toe the line enough for even Fox to stay at Fox. So it takes courage at some point, left or right. It takes courage to challenge. It certainly takes political courage. Most very smart people who have the savoir faire to speak more candidly probably don't want the public colonoscopy of having their private lives for everyone to fight over. Most people that have that kind of intelligence also have the kind of wisdom. They don't want to be a part of it. They're like Thomas Jefferson. They go off to Monticello and they disappear. Or Montaigne in France just goes off to his house and shuts the doors. You could argue that that's not taking social responsibility, and it's possibly true. Um, But there aren't a lot of – there are, again, left or right. There are braver people coming up, and hopefully uh, they'll – but even the smartest man in the room, even Santa Claus in the White House, (laughs) if you want to believe in in the tooth fairy saving us, no matter who comes in, and frankly, that includes, you know, Javier Millet in in Argentina, no matter who comes in, no one can solve these problems easily. No one. There is no instant solution without some constructive destruction, some pain. I'm not talking about revolution and pitchforks. I'm talking about just financial policies, austerity, spending cuts, welfare program truncation, VA program. These are just realities. Mm -hmm. They're not nice or pleasant things, but we have to rethink what this means. No one coming in, no matter how moral, no matter how financially savvy, no matter how ethical, and that's rare, if not impossible to find in our Congress. I would rather sell used cars somewhere in the desert than be a member of Congress right now. I'd be embarrassed to have that post, literally. What it takes when you have four lobbyists behind you to get you elected and then four lobbyists behind you, literally per congressman, to to tell you what to vote for. That's not democracy. Again, left or right, that's not democracy. So I, I think democracy is a shadow of its former ideal. But no matter who came in, even the most ethical person, if they were magically created today, the problems we have now are, are beyond solving easily. The sad thing is the politicians and the opportunists from Klaus Schwab to the White House to, the, to Brussels will, will inevitably lead towards more and more control, which means less and less freedom, which means you know people left and right that are trying to, to espouse freedom, more transparency are really, truly heroic. On the financial side, I don't see a lot of heroics, uh, whether it's at the ECB or the Fed or the Bank of England. They're buying time. They're buying time. Right now, Yellen and Powell are buying time through these mechanizations with you know, the, the yield curve and issuing on the short end or bailing out the TGA account. But what's going to inevitably happen is we're just going to have to come up with more synthetic liquidity. Or as Ernest Hemingway said, in addition to debasing your currency, you're going to have to go to war and create a wartime economy. And frankly, since I was born during Vietnam, I can't think of an era where we weren't somewhere spreading peace and democracy in the world. And uh, 
uh, I've always said, though, this is nothing against our soldiers, guys from Bob Moriarty to my friends who went to the West Point of the Naval Academy, and many of whom from the Midwest who never came back. They, they're the, they're, they are the lions being led by donkeys. The problem isn't our soldiers. The problem is our policies. And look, you look at Afghanistan, you look at Iraq, you look at Syria, you look at Libya, you look now at what we got ourselves in a proxy war in the Ukraine. All of these things were foreseeably disastrous because there was no real plan other than creating a, a wartime distraction, which is something Hemingway warned about. Hemingway was a veteran of World War I, and he was a partaker as a journalist in World War II. He saw beyond the glory or the politics of war, wasn't afraid of it. I'm saying there's something wrong. We have debasement of our currency, and we have a wartime-like uh, economy when we're not officially at war, and yet America's always somewhere, and our defense budget is immense. And there are many who argue you need a strong defense to avoid war. I'm not going to get in. I, I just have an opinion, but there's something broken. And uh, sadly, the ones that are paying for this are the middle class, and the ones that are getting sent to these wars are usually lower middle class. Uh, there are a few exceptions to that. So it's a social problem. It's a financial problem. It's a political problem. It's an historical problem. And it does, sadly, all come back to the yield curve, the bond market, the currency, and politics and central banks. So these things aren't just boring. We haven't even talked about gold yet. These are not just gold, gold bull or gold bear debates or currency debates. These are the times we live in. And the indicators are real time. They're, they're right in front of us right now. For anyone who wants to take the time beyond a Twitter mindset or a Twitter attention span to learn this, it's not that hard. Mm -hmm. Well, you know, going back to the point that you were making about these, the demand for the tenure, right? Mm -hmm. We've seen a run back into them in levels not seen since 2009. So is that because the market believes Powell's war on inflation has been won? Or, you know, to your, to your point, is that just, you know, another symptom of this sick, dying patient? Yeah, again, I repeat, maybe I didn't make it clear, this was the biggest movement in the bond market in 40 years. You could say the 10-year has been revived. There's a renaissance, there's a retrust. And my, my, there are three or four arguments. Again, I'll repeat, that was an easing, backdoor easing through the Treasury Department by issuing more bonds on the short end of the curve. That wasn't a rush to the 10-year. It really wasn't. Mm -hmm. um, and it wasn't really a flight to safety. And the U.S. Department uh, and the Fed or the you know, Yellen and Powell, I'm sure, discussed this. They also, I mean, really, they emptied out the TGA, or the Treasury General, account, like they did last October in, in, in Q3 of 2022. It's, it's backdoor liquidity. It buys time. Not a lot of time, but it buys time. The other argument being made by Wall Street is, well, the smart money and the dumb money both got it wrong. The smart money think Powell's won the war on inflation. So now it's back into the 10-year bond. We can get some, we're going to get some good yield. We're buying at a discount. The higher for longer brought bond prices down. Let's buy a little low. And uh, we beat the war on inflation, so it's good to buy. And Wall Street is also buying 10-year treasuries, they say, because they expect more QE. That's going to push bond prices down, um, uh, or excuse me, push bond prices up. So let's buy them low because QE is going to come, artificially push those up. Yields are going to come down. I'm saying... <laughs> That's not what's really happening, though. Wall Street and Main Street aren't really pouring into the 10-year. There, there is definitely more buyer. They call that household. Even hedge funds buying 10-year treasuries considered household uh, uh, purchasing. T the hedge funds are using it as a place to hold cash. Wall Street, even if they think that QE is coming and, and that bond yields are going to be compressed because bond prices are coming up, so they're buying them now. Well, if, if QE comes to the level it's going to be necessary to support the bond market, you're going to have higher inflation. So whatever you get in return on the bond price uh, increase, you're going to lose to the inherent purchasing power. It, it's a lose-lose scenario. But to answer your question, I don't think the November rush into treasuries was a safe haven sign that the 10-year is back. The 10-year will only come back when the, when the Fed starts buying more of them because the real demand foreign... Um, it's just not there. Central banks, it's just not there. And as the dollar does get stronger under Powell's policy, um, you have to understand there's $14 trillion in US dollar denominated debt that isn't necessarily owed to US banks floating around in the world right now. $14 trillion has to be paid back. And Powell's higher rate policy, that means those parties have to sell US treasuries to get liquidity in dollars to pay off loans. And of those you know, there's 7.6 trillion in U.S. Treasuries being held offshore. 
well, if, if whether it's China or whether it's in London or whether that's in France or Germany, if they if those people have to sell off treasuries or even in Turkey to get more dollars, um, that means that means there's going to be um, less. There's going to be a need to create more and more U.S. treasuries and no one's going to be buying them. So the Fed will have to print money. That's again, it's this vicious circle. No matter how you look at it, at some point, there's a gap between supply and demand. And at some point. When there's less and less demand, more selling of U.S. Treasuries, that puts more downward pressure on the price of bonds, which means higher price pressure on higher pressure on yields. Higher yields means higher interest rates. Uncle Sam cannot let, allow for a sell-off in U.S. Treasuries. It can't allow for net, no buyers at the Treasury auctions because that, without those, bond prices tank even further, yields spike even more. If yields spike, that's the true interest rate. That's their biggest fear. So they're going to have to artificially support this Treasury market, and that means. In my opinion, and this is where Brent and I probably didn't get a chance to talk about it enough, an unbelievable amount of central bank, or your, I should say Federal Reserve uh, money creation to support the bond market. And, and I, I think that will happen whenever and whatever sets off an inevitable reversion to the mean in the S&P, the Dow and the NASDAQ. Right now, it's quote unquote resilient, although again, led by only seven names in the S&P 500. But when we start seeing debt rollovers at higher rates, when we have some geopolitical event, and I don't know what it'll be, when something triggers a mean reversion in the stock markets, that's the last thing holding. That's the last line of defense. Then we're going to see, like we did in March of 2020, massive amounts of liquidity. And that's uh, unfortunately very detrimental to the US dollar's purchasing power. Now, it's relative strength, both, but uh, in particular, it's purchasing power, which is why you see central banks and investors in the Middle East and Turkey and all over the world preferring physical gold over a U.S. Treasury. That's why China dumped $27 billion worth of uh, U.S. Treasuries overnight to buy liquid natural gas from, from Qatar, because they'd rather have 10, you know, 10 years of liquid natural gas than 10 more minutes of a U.S. Treasury a bogus asset. Again, there's signs of this all over the place. In, 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 in China, cannot, does not want to be beholden to the U.S. dollar. So China will now buy oil from Russia, and Russia will sell it to them in Chinese yuan, and then Russia will go to the Shanghai Gold Exchange, you know, and just convert that yuan into gold, and they're stacking gold. Again, this take out the gold executive profile that I have, or the gold bias, and just look at this realistically. If and I've said this in other interviews, if you see on the border an army bringing horses and cannons and troops, that means they're preparing for something. It's obvious. If thousands of horses are coming, thousands of cannons, thousands of soldiers, there's tents all over the horizon. Pick a battle, pick Waterloo, pick Gettysburg, pick any time in history, pick, you know, the you know, Barbarossa going into East Europe, pick any military example. It's obvious what's coming next. Well, when you see central banks at record levels stacking gold and dumping treasuries, that's an army in the move. They're preparing for something. And what they're saying is I'd rather have my safety asset be a, a real asset rather than a paper currency, including the paper currency and the IOU of Uncle Sam, the world reserve currency. I don't think that's a gold bull argument or a negative argument or just a bearish to be bearish argument. It's common sense. And uh, but again, these things don't make the headlines. They don't make the headlines, um, sadly. But uh, history moves in very obvious patterns, and we're just seeing the same thing all over again. You know, before we move right to the subject of gold, Matt, does it matter that these settlement deals for energy and commodities outside the dollar have started to happen? Or is it, you know, such a small fraction of demand at this point that it doesn't make a material difference? Yeah, I mean, look, you know, there's, and again, these are fair arguments and fair questions. And this is the stuff that kind of, you know, Brent Johnson would argue. It's like, look, you know, you get, look at look at global GDP, 70% of that is in U.S. dollars. It's paid in, in 70. Look at global trade, 80% of that is in U.S. dollars. So come on. You can worry about de-dollarization, the BRICS plus. You can worry about the Shanghai Gold Exchange making a fair price movement in gold. You can you can argue that there are now 44 countries making bilateral trade agreements outside of the U.S. dollar, but the U.S. dollar is still here to stay. It's immortal and it's important. And I, in a lot of ways, I would agree those settlements and that U.S. currency is still relatively better than anything else. But it's like Hemingway's description of poverty: things happen slowly, then all at once, because. You can settle in U.S. dollars, but where do you store your your? In other words, what do you hold as a safety? You may be settling in Saudi Arabia right now. Uh, trade between Saudi Arabia and China is twice as what it is with with Europe and the U.S. They're still even settling between Saudi Arabia and China in U.S. dollars. But then, what's 
what are they doing with those US dollars? They're buying Chinese goods. In other words, and you have 44 countries that are settling outside of the US dollar. You have BRICS plus nations, which are rich in real assets, looking for ways to make deals outside of the US dollar. That may seem like a mere dent in the great almighty shield that is the US dollar. But again, slowly, then all at once. What you're able to see now um, is a very slow, and as I said, when the sanctions began, and many others agreed with me, from Rickards to Grant Williams, this was an irrevocable moment in history, 2022, and the sanctions. Absolutely stupid. Keynes warned against it. Robert Triffin warns against it. Barack Obama warned against weaponizing the U.S. dollar, because that means more and more countries are going to move away from that dollar. China and Russia couldn't wait for an excuse to get away from the U.S. dollar. The promise was that the West would 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 run out would, would be fine with energy and that the east China, russia would run out of rubles and go broke and that that russia would go broke before the west ran out of energy that was simply not true that's not at all what happened it's the opposite literally the opposite and all china and russia did is make more bilateral deals and the brics countries are finding ways to to trade and settle in the shanghai gold exchange and in and, and doing things you know, basically bartering the real assets for wine, which could then be converted to gold while central banks stack gold. I don't think these things are minor anymore. I don't think the fact that GDP for the BRICS plus nations is going to surpass the G7 is a minor thing. Some people say, no, that, that data is irrelevant or that data is not important. I just don't agree. Now, again, could be wrong. We'll see where the DXY goes in the next five years. But there's absolutely no doubt that Russia and China don't want to be the dog whaled by... Uh, they don't want the U.S. being the tail that wags their dog. They're sick of it. Generations of watching a debt-stroked America, debt-strapped America, influence policy all over the world, exporting their inflation, debasing currencies that are pegged to them. Look what's happened to the yo-yo of the Japanese yen because of the U.S. dollar. Look what happened to the gilt markets last October in the U.K. because of Powell's rate hikes. This, this bullying U.S. dollar, again, Brent Johnson would agree, is a bully isn't immortal. And there is a move, a clear move, not just with de-dollarization of the BRICS, but a clear move in the gold markets. There's a clear arbitrage going on outside uh, of the US dollar that I think is very significant. And then when you add on to this massive change in the respect for and trust in the US dollar and US policy and US politicians, it's global. And then you look at that at the same time that you're seeing, and I'm not proponent of being a citizen of Russia or China. I'm not in favor of this. I'm not excited about this. But you can't deny, especially in Europe, the movement of money and gold east from the west and the arbitraging going on through the Shanghai Gold Exchange with real assets and that the BRICs are slowly trying to find ways around the US dollar. I think that's significant, not just a headline. I think all the gold all the hype about a gold backs brick currency coming out this July was nonsense. I said it before and I said it after. That doesn't do well. Uh, I think for a lot of people in our industry, they're trying to make people understand that, that was never going to happen for a lot of reasons, but it doesn't need to happen. You don't need a gold backed currency for countries to get away from the dollar. You don't have to just replace the US dollar with some BRICS gold backed currency. It can be far more subtle, but far more powerful than that. First of all, none of the BRICS countries want to give up their right to be able to print their own local currencies if they need to. They don't want to give that up. They don't want a gold-backed chaperone, just like Nixon didn't want it. But what they can do is effectively make transactions and real assets and scrub them through gold exchanges or swap lines or central banks outside of the US dollar and a SWIFT system being replaced by a new system, not overnight. But the dollar's days of hegemony are completely over. Its supremacy still stands today, but its hegemony is over. And you know this will not happen overnight, but it is already happening. And again, I, I don't think that's just being a, uh, I think we'll, we'll either see massive amounts of synthetic liquidity to bail out this broken fiat currency system in the US and in Europe, or we might see another Plaza Accord or Bretton Woods 2.0, which the IMF telegraphed in the midst of COVID, which we've talked about in the past. They've already telegraphed like a, like a PSYOP what they're going to do. They plant the seeds and then they say they told you so. And they said COVID was as much of a crisis as World War II was, so hence the need for Bretton Woods. Again, we won't get into the details. COVID and World War II are an insulting comparison. There's nothing close. They're not even close, especially as Europeans would know. But again, they're coming up with a, a pretext to have some kind of reshuffling of the of the chairs on the, the deck chairs on the Titanic. Again, blaming all these things on external events like bad guys in Russia uh, or problems in the Middle East, when the real reason we're in debt and the real reason we're losing our respect for our currency and our IOUs is because of our own policies. 
they'll come up with something that 90% of the people don't understand. And they'll say it's for your own good. We're going to restructure credit markets. We're going to restructure currency markets. We're probably going to introduce central bank digital currency for your own good, for better, faster, efficient payment system. They'll ignore all of the bad that comes with that. And most people won't know because they'll trust. Uh, and that's that's the saddest thing of all. Yeah, I think one of the real headwinds that we have as a society is trying to pay attention to all of these things, along with worrying about, you know, just feeding your family, right? Yeah, there's, yeah, there's so many of those, so many people that don't have the luxury of paying attention to all of these different issues like this. Um, yeah, yeah. But Matt, as you're talking about the Shanghai Gold Exchange, and how, you know, there's so much gold really moving east, do you do you think that we're going to get to a point where the Shanghai exchange ends up setting the price rather than really London and the COMEX? I think that's clearly the long-term play here and even shorter term than you realize. I mean, there was a lot of talk last year and the year before about the Moscow gold exchange, the Moscow world standard, like the, the Moscow would be the home of this. And that's there's still plenty to talk about there. But in the meantime, the Shanghai gold exchange because Shanghai and or China and Russia are so intrinsically aligned. China needs oil. It needs oil outside of the US dollar. And that's already happening. That's a seismic shift. And Saudi Arabia so far isn't selling directly uh, to China and Yuan from, but you know, you can see how they could create a swap with gold to do that. You could see how you could sell oil uh, in the UK, convert it to gold, go to China, use that gold to buy. Juan, use that wand to buy cheaper oil. You can see an arbitrage coming up. And you can see that what happened with the gold price, you know, when gold price, when gold went to 2100 and above and then came down to the 2000 level, what was fascinating, again, didn't make the headlines. Lou Groman caught this. Um, is that the Shanghai Gold Exchange, the premiums actually went up 3% as gold was coming down. And that's there's implications to that. How could the premiums go up as gold's coming down in price? Because what's happening, what Shanghai and China knows and what Russia knows, because they've been watching America because they play chess, not checkers like Biden, who can probably not play checkers, but they're thinking long term. And they've there's they're, they're societies that have suffered wars and, and, and oppression and they create oppression. I'm not again, I'm not a big fan of China and Russia in a lot of ways. I'm saying they're a very patient adversary. They're a very patient and intelligent adversary. And what they what they see is you can't have a gold exchange in the east and a gold exchange in the west where in the east gold is being priced fairly where the 200 day moving average is high and the gold exchange in london or new york is low no one's going to put up with that there's going to be a movement more and more away that paper short that goes out at 2:30 every afternoon at the comex or the otc markets where they basically sell sell gold paper contracts to keep the gold price repressed that game is coming to a slow end for a number of reasons. But it, one of the main reasons, in addition to higher rates making it, they need to deleverage. One of the other reasons is, look, if China's fairly pricing gold based on actual supply and demand, and in the West, it's based on the COMEX and a bunch of LBMA banks, eight or nine banks artificially shorting the gold price, which one would you rather go to if you're somewhere in the middle? Which nation is going to trust a manipulated COMEX OTC market and futures contract manipulated price of gold, or go to China and get a better deal, or maybe eventually go to the Moscow world standard. These things I don't know all the answers to, but it's clearly already happening. It's mm -hmm. already happening. You can't have two gold markets, one in the West and one in the East, without one losing. Mm -hmm. um, and so, again, even the IMF, when it talked about a Bretton Woods 2.0 and a central bank digital currency, even they were talking about a partial coverage of gold because they won't have any credibility. If the only solution is the, from the West is a digital fiat while the East is going gold, um, I'm sorry, that's just not going to fly. Even, even, even most capital markets would say, well, I, I think the Chinese system, I hate to say it, which has a lot of problems, a ton of hair on it, is still better with, than, than the OTC or the forward, future contra, uh, forward contract market, the future contract market, the gold price. So these are all, again, things worth debating in more detail. It's impossible to do that each of these silos. But again, it's not even a gold bug argument. If the IMF does it or if Shanghai Gold Exchange does it, either way, gold is in the discussion. And again, I'm not being anti-crypto or other things, but central banks aren't buying cryptos right now. I mean, you could buy cryptos for a lot of reasons and speculation or maybe wealth preservation. I, I think it's more of a speculation asset. Certainly moves faster as the dollar gets weaker than gold does. But these 
this barbarous relic, this pet rock. It's not. Sanskrit, someone sent me an email the other day, there's like 48 different names for gold in Sanskrit, the oldest language in the world, because gold has some, there won't be 48 names for Bitcoin 5,000 years from now. It may be very powerful. It may be very relevant. Cryptos may be very important. I'm saying right now, these central banks, these economies, these investors are much more trusting in physical gold than they are in anything else. And it's still not a barbarous relic, but a timeless asset and store of value and wealth preservation. I really do believe that. That is me talking in my book, but it's also common sense. Mm -hmm. It doesn't mean that if you're a crypto bull that you're stupid or that you're going to lose money. There's volatility in it. Most people know that. They accept that. Um, frankly, most people in the middle class don't even have the luxury to debate crypto versus gold. They don't have a choice. They're, like you said, trying to pay rent. That's the real tragedy. Mm -hmm. This is just you know, fluffy debate for them. And I understand. But nevertheless, as countries go broke, it affects all of us. Lower, middle, higher class it affects all of us because we lose more and more of our liberties. But I do think um, this movement to gold, this movement to uh, swaps, this movement to the Shanghai Gold Exchange, even the rise of the Moscow World Standard are, are, are seismic shifts. And as Grant Williams and I talked about, literally from the day of the sanctions, that was as big a moment in the history of currency markets as 1971 in August. Hmm. And it took 50 years for gold to you know, to destroy the U.S. dollar like by 98%. The purchasing power of a milligram of gold versus a U.S. dollar is, or any major fiat currency, they've all lost 95 to 98% against a physical asset like gold. Um, but again, it's going to be a death by a thousand cuts again with this weaponization of the U.S. dollar, with this movement away from the U.S. dollar. It will not be overnight, but it's, irre it's irrevocable. The thing that's going to kill the U.S. dollar isn't the Shanghai Gold Exchange or de-dollarization or a BRICS plus sudden mega movement. The thing that's going to kill the U.S. dollar is U.S. policymakers themselves. They're going to continually debase their currency to pay for their own IOUs because no one else, or at least not enough people, are buying them. It's just mm -hmm. that simple. Yeah, and I think it's worth reiterating the point that you made earlier, that this is not something that just happens overnight. These in a way, cosmic shifts happen very slowly, glacially even. And then it seems that there's a tipping point like, you know, countries using swap lines or trade agreements outside the US dollar, gold moving east, these things all of a sudden reach a critical mass. And then all of that momentum just shifts to the other side of the boat, right? Yeah. And I think with gold, again, that's why gold is not a powerful conversation in a lot of investments or a lot of family offices or even a lot of individual investors because it's what 0.5% of all global assets. It's a very it's a very finite asset with an infinite duration, unlike a US Treasury or a Deutsche Bund or anything else. But it's a, it's an extremely finite asset. If it goes from even 0.5 to 1% or one and a half percent, the gold price is gonna rip. But no one that we know, and we have clients from 90 countries and they're high net worth clients because our minimums are so so high. But no one we know is buying gold to make to get rich, including Egon von Greyers or myself. Gold is not going to make you richer. Bitcoin could. Other assets on the S&P could. Certain trading strategies with leverage could. Certain SPACs could. Certain private equity could with a huge amount of risk. But no one comes to us with 5, 10, 20 million in gold to get rich. And no one at the central banks in the East are buying gold to get rich, although they could see massive appreciation. But I've always said, when gold's at 5,000, a loaf of bread's going to be very painful too. What gold does is it preserves your purchasing power. It's a real, it's a, it's a real asset. And um, again, these are, these are boring things to many people who are looking for growth. I'm, I learned in Wall Street that the way to get rich is not to get poor. In other words, don't get your, you know, don't get your stuff handed to you. Don't, don't lose it all. And I've seen that happen to so many investors and family offices and families that were thinking only where the hockey puck is, not where it could be going. And they weren't preparing for risk. A lot of hedge fund managers only make thoughts about projections. They don't manage risk. Of the 14,000 hedge funds, there's probably 10 to 20% that actually manage risk. And that's how they become profitable, by thinking about risk first. And I think if it, it, to understand physical gold, it's not worth having a conversation of what it does versus the S&P during a certain year. Although since Egon bought it, it's outperformed the S&P. But that's irrelevant because you can pick your windows. Mm -hmm. What gold always does is preserve your purchasing power. And if you look back to the unimmaculate conception of the central bank or the Federal Reserve in 1913, 
if you wanted to, if you had a thousand dollars, U.S. dollars in 1913, you could you could walk in, you could buy 48 ounces of gold with that thousand dollars. If you have a thousand dollars in 2024, you can buy a half of ounce of gold with that thousand dollars. So that didn't make you rich; it preserved the purchasing power. In other words, gold preserves your purchasing power. That thousand dollars in 1913 could do a lot more than it could today. And a hundred dollars twenty or fifty years ago could buy a lot more Big Macs than it could today. So if you're measuring your wealth and paper money, it's a death by a thousand cuts form of poverty. Gold investors at this level are, are only preserving capital. They're not trying to double their money, although the gold price could easily double in the next 10 years. When it does, the other dollars or kroners or yen or yuan or pesos that they have are losing value. And, and we could... You could look at Argentina. We were talking before this call. I have a lot of friends in Argentina, you know, and I, I have a lot of reasons to love Argentina, but they have immense inflation and they have immense interest rates. But in, in, in Argentina, your peso isn't worth nothing. It's worth nothing. And everyone knows that. But they have a system there where you'll buy something at a store, but you'll have it on credit. So I'll pay you back in 30 days. And they know that in 30 days, there's going to be so much more inflation if they fix that price now, the 30 days from now, they can inflate away some of the pain. And then during that 30 days, they're going to hold dollars as an inflation hedge. Well, that's just what the world's doing with gold. They see the dollar getting debased. They see the US system is broken. It may be the best horse in glue factory, but it's broken. They're stacking physical gold, not US treasuries, because it holds its value better. They're like the Argentinian citizen. They're forced to be creative with how they time their purchases and how they hold their value. Central banks aren't holding physical gold to get rich. They're holding physical gold to not get poor. Just like in Argentina, you try to extend that payment 30 days because you know you're going to be able to inflate away some of the pain. That's what Powell's doing. By He says he's fighting inflation. He's not. Every debt-soaked country tries to inflate away its debt. This is something Russell Napier and I talked about three or four years ago before inflation was even a headline. We were talking together about it. He said, this is always the case. You, you, you just have to have inflation higher than interest rates. I mean, you just have to have negative real rates and you can inflate away debt. What Powell does is he just lies about inflation. We just say it's at 3.2%. When you talk to John Williams, it's closer to 10%. So we do have negative real rates. But even in a positive real rate environment that the Fed tells us, gold is still reaching all-time highs. Because deep down, no one trusts the Uncle Sam's IOU and no one trusts that greenback anymore. Not the way it was in 1944 or 1970 before we got off the chaperone and made our dollar cheap, made it debasable, made it watered down. So again, the movement in gold right now in China, young people are buying gold, not tech stocks. It's, it's understood. It's, it's like buying real estate during a real estate boom. They're buying gold. But the difference between gold and tech stocks or real estate is gold is finite. It's a mm -hmm. finite asset. Its stock to flow ratio is relatively fixed. There's only so much of it. Again, you can make the same argument about Bitcoin. But uh, what's happening in China is, is fascinating. Uh, uh, and you know, again, like I said, the West can't let gold rip in China and not have it rip in the West. Otherwise, there'll there'll be real problems with the U.S. dollar. So again, these are big picture things. These are not buy gold to get rich, or you know, look at these different stocks. You know, the stock market will go up or down depending on whether the dollar is weak or strong. If the dollar is debased and deflated, and we see a pivot or some type of more liquidity, and the dollar is at ninety five to ninety seven to one hundred, markets will go up. The DXY goes above 107, 110, they'll go down. It's just, as Luke Roman said, QE and QT are no longer dials like a thermostat. They're just a switch, on or off, on or off. It's very simple. Mm -hmm. And the only reason markets have been quote unquote resilient is there's such a priced in pivot to QE. We all thought it was coming this year. It hasn't happened yet. I thought it was coming after the bank crisis. I really did. I got it wrong. But it doesn't mean I'm wrong longer term. I knew it was going to rain. I just got the day or the time of the day of the rain wrong, but it's still going to rain liquidity and it'll take an event, probably a market correction of significance, like we saw in March of 2020 for super QE to come back. And by that point, we'll have bigger problems than just the stock market because things will be going so wrong. And again, that's a very negative thing to say, very sensational. And that's why guys like Rick Rule, whether he means it or not, says, I don't, I buy gold because I'm afraid it'll go up. Because when gold goes up, it's everything else is bad. Deep down, I think he knows gold's going up, but it's not going to be because the world's doing well. Uh, and uh, yeah, my view is very bearish, uh, very mm -hmm. bearish. Well, again, I think it kind of comes back to that tipping point idea. You know, we've not seen 
major volatility, any of these corrections that should have happened along the way to correct these excesses. And I think that is only going to make the correction a lot worse when it actually comes to comes well, that's to a great point. comes to yeah. front. I mean, Tom, think about it. 2018, people's memories are short. Throughout 2018, Powell was doing QT and reducing the balance sheet at the same time. Every quarter, raising the interest rates. So he was doing what he's doing right now, higher for longer. Mm-hmm. He was doing the exact same thing. He was trying to reload his guns, you know, f- you know, reduce the balance sheet and raise rates. So we have some tools left when we had a real recession. If you remember, 2018, market volatility by December was like a thousand basis points a day. It was crazy. Markets were gyrating. They were panicking. 2019 came along by Christmas, January 1st, by New Year's Eve. He had to pause. By September of 2019, we had a repo crisis. By March of 2020, we had unlimited QE. So Powell has tried this before. Raise rates, raise rates, cut the balance sheet. Then he went to a pause, and then we went to unlimited QE. We had a major micro crisis. So we already had that. We had a 36 drop in the S&P in a matter of days, and then we printed $5 trillion over the next period of months. So this isn't even speculation. This is a template we've seen before. People have just forgotten because COVID got in the way and Fed speak got in the way and be calm, carry on got in the way. The Fed has done this game before of QT and reducing balance sheets while raising rates. And it led to a disaster, a disaster. And the only solution to that disaster was unlimited QE that even I didn't think was possible that many trillions that fast. And so I've given up believing that there's anything sane about central bank policy if we could print trillions in a matter of months in 2020, just imagine what happens when this bubble pops, when this same policy that he tried to follow throughout 2018 and 19 backfires. And it is backfiring. We've seen things break at the gilt markets, the regional bank level. We've seen things break in the bond and the JGB. Things are already breaking. They're certainly breaking on Main Street. So this is not a sustainable policy. That's not even sensational. Just look at the data from Main Street to central banks, to currencies, to rates, to repo market mechanizations, the TGA accounts. DC is chasing its tail trying to buy time. They don't have a solution. It's either kill the bond market or kill the currency. They're going to kill the currency. And I haven't seen not a single exception to this rule throughout any time in history. That's why I believe so much in gold. And that's why many people believe in Bitcoin. Philosophically, they don't trust the US dollar or the euro, or whatever paper currency. You just have to be patient, and you have to have common sense. I personally choose physical gold. Uh, but Bitcoin can be more volatile, or crypto can be more volatile. They can be mismanaged by jackasses like Sam Bankman fried or CZ. But the, the principle behind it makes sense. Um, but uh, for me, gold is just safer, especially physical gold that I hold, not in a bank and not in an ETF. Mm-hmm. Um, it's just common sense. It's not a get-rich-quick scheme. It's just you know getting an umbrella when it's starting to rain. That's how I look at it. And seeing those horses on the battlefield, again, yeah, kind of yeah, yeah. The, the horses in the tent setting up. They're, they're setting up. Yeah. yeah. Matt, I think that's a great place to kind of wrap up today's conversation. Is there anything else that you wanted to add for our listeners before we do? I mean, you know me, I never shut up. So I'm sure we've I've said anything I could possibly say. I uh, appreciate the conversation. And I, I, I always end by just saying, you know, challenge me, challenge you, challenge your own views, look at different mm-hmm. asset classes, look at the melt. There's a melt up possibility, there's a meltdown possibility. Look at different opinions. No one has all the answers. But uh, again, sometimes it's as simple as common sense. You don't have to time this. You just have to be prepared for this. I, I think that's an important thing to think about. And uh, yeah, I'll leave it at that. Mm-hmm. And for those of you that want to read more of Matt's work, it's available at goldswitzerland.com, right? Yeah. Thanks, Tom. Yeah. Excellent. Thanks, Matt. Always a pleasure. Me too. This podcast is for general informational purposes only. Nothing on this podcast should be taken as investment advice. Guests on this show are not compensated for their appearance. Listeners are urged to educate themselves and make their own decisions. Do not base any investment decisions on the information contained. To view our full disclaimer, please visit our website.